So welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're excited to see uh, lots of families uh, coming back to learn more about biomedical medicine with Dr. Sonia Doherty. Uh, we are um, busy here tonight uh, dealing with other ways to, uh, to teach our kiddos and, and how to put together bits and pieces of language and speech and, and all those things. But truly, um, it starts with the body. Uh, once you get the body under control, then the rest, the rest comes. The learning atmosphere is um, the the stage is set for learning. So with that, I will um, assign Doctor so Doctor Doherty um, our spotlight here, and away we go. All right. So um, I think a great starting point. Um, would be to take questions from last time, just to see if if you have any questions, clarifications um, about methyl B12 and or the dietary intervention. Does anyone have any questions? You can put them into the chat or you can come on and, and ask. All right, well, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, go on to another one of the uh, most important you know core biomedical treatments is interesting I think particularly for parents who have visual symptoms so I think you know we we do have sort of a smaller group today so do you guys have kids who have any of these visual symptoms I'm going to pull up um this is just kind of my website and I use it for education, but I also think it's a great thing to do when I'm doing seminars because I can kind of toggle back and forth um, to what we're talking about. So, you know, here I have the core four biomedical treatments. These are the most important treatments in my opinion, my experience over the last 18 years. And then here is a section that for some parents is really quite interesting. Now, um, I'd love to know if you guys have kids who have any of these symptoms. So the, if you don't have these symptoms, you may not find this content that interesting. So um, <laughs> I'm not sure whether or not to go into it, but I suppose without without any feedback, I'll just kind of plow through. Oh, I got someone here. Thank you. All right. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, so this is this is great. So there's a really interesting TED talk um, that I watched years ago, and it's called "How Brains Learn to See." And I'm not going to put it on now, but I I really recommend that you take a look at this because this is one of the only people in the world to actually study uh, visual processing for children diagnosed with autism. And the TED, the TED talks a little bit about robotics. I think he's, you know, he's interested in lots of different things, but his team, uh, and he's a, what is he, a visual neuroscientist. And so he researches how our brains interpret what our eyes are seeing. And he's one of the only people I've ever seen study children diagnosed with autism and figure out that they actually have something very specific that's going on with their eyes. So they have problems tracking moving information or what is sometimes called dynamic processing. So dynamic processing is when we look at information that is moving around and when our kids lack, you know, visual processing, they, they are trying to repair it. So the analogy I often give is if I was hit by a bus, hopefully someone would save my life. And then I would go to rehab and in rehab, you know, physiotherapy or occupational therapy, I would actually do repetitive actions, whether it's, you know, walking back and forth or exercises that would be assigned by a therapist that are repetitive in nature. And so when our kids are doing these things in front of their eyes, they're lining things up, they're spinning, they're, you know, they're shaking their head, they're squinting. Um, or they're avoiding eye contact, what's happening is they are at the bottom stage here of how the brain learns to see. And we know that this actually happens in babies. So when babies are born, they 
you know, they can't see mom and dad. They see like the mom blob and the dad blob and it's kind of fuzzy. That's why we're, we're often told with younger babies or infants to give them black and white toys because it's easier for them to pick up um, black and white. Babies work on integrating uh, information that's dense um, and then eventually they can kind of put things together. But all the stuff that babies do when they bring things in front of their eyes and, and they play with toys is to train their brain how to actually see. And so in autism, they're actually stuck here or they go back there through regression. Um, they are unable to process moving information. And so our faces move all the time. The muscles in our mouth, um, our face have micro movements. And I've been told by people diagnosed with autism that it's very uncomfortable to try to process all those movements. We also don't respond the same way as humans to situations. Every time we respond, it's a little bit different. And this can get into some of the behaviors or the social issues that children have is they're really trying to track this information and make sense of it. But if we sort of stick to the vision for right now, um, when you have damage to the retinoid receptors or the ability to process visual information, you're going to do exactly what I would have to do if I was hit by a bus, right? Go to therapy and do repetitive behaviors or repetitive activities to repair the damage uh, or reconnect the retinoid receptors. And so one of the most fascinating things for me to have learned after many years, you know, treating autism is that visual processing, problems with eye contact, spinning, looking at the sides of your eyes, like I said, shaking your head. That's why I have this other list here. Um, these are all medical and they're actually all treatable. And they're treatable whether you're two years old or you're 40 years old. Um, certainly takes longer in the 40-year-olds, but this is how the brain learns to see. So once you can track information that's moving, then you can move on to grouping it. This is where kids might line things up or they might put things in actual groups. I see this in my office where they dump toys and then they group them. Um, and then they start to visually integrate and, and they can recognize things. But a lot of what we see in these visual behaviors in autism um, are actually because of the medical um, disconnection between the retinoid receptors. And it's treated with vitamin A. Um, I'll show you this research in a minute. I'll just make a note of this. But uh, the treatment is very safe. It's, it's very straightforward. And it was discovered by a pediatrician in Virginia. And so she had this theory that damage to these parts of the, the cells in the eyes would lead to the visual symptoms. And if you combine that information with this TED Talk, the how brains learn to see, uh, we start to realize that the brain needs a tremendous amount of energy to process this visual information. And so that, that goes into sort of mitochondrial treatment, which I will touch on today. Um, but I think it's interesting to have somewhat of a goal in mind. I mean, we can talk about speech. Uh, speech improves significantly for most kids with methyl B12 injections. Uh, eye contact and the visual symptoms improve dramatically when you treat with the proper form of vitamin A, uh, which we'll get into, and the right dose. Dosing and form. Uh, are probably the most poorly understood interventions in autism. Lots of naturopaths even won't use the right vitamin A, they won't use a vitamin A, and they certainly don't go high enough. If your child is here, they're actually stuck very young, right? They're stuck in that un under 12 month year of age in terms of their brain learning how to deal with the world. Um, we also see this in regression, unfortunately, I hear these stories a lot. Um, your child is developing typically, and then they stop responding. It looks like they go away, or as Robin said, there's sort of that fog, um, and they're not processing the world visually. They have lost that. That's a medical. That's a medical problem. That is the same thing as me being hit by a bus and me losing the ability to walk. I can gain it back, but I need to do repetitive behaviors. I need to reconnect my brain and my legs. So what we need to do with vitamin A and omega-3 fatty acids, again, at the right dose, is we re need to reconnect the retinoid receptors, the, the receptors in the eyes, and we need to connect that with the rest of the brain. And so this actually is my first sort of step in treatment. I do recommend the methyl B12 and the diet, 
but as parents are working on that, both the diet and trying to see if they're ready for injections, this treatment um, can start to get results with the visual symptoms quite quickly. So I will sort of sneak back to my website here because I just wanted to show you that that hierarchy of of how the brain learns to see. Um, but there are doctors in the U.S. who believe that autism is a visual issue, and because the children and adults don't have enough uh, energy or they don't have the ability to process the world visually, then they start to develop these symptoms. And, and these symptoms persist unless you treat them. Uh, it's quite fascinating to see these symptoms go away in an adolescent child or, you know, a 20, 30 year old. And I think that the earlier you get started, the more um, your child can interact with their world. And this has a direct correlation with eye contact, which of course then helps with social interaction. Um, you need to look at people to learn how they're responding socially to sort of learn and start tracking that information. You also need to look at people's mouth to learn how to talk. So one of the things that happens when uh, parents start this treatment for their kids is they'll they'll say, oh, now my child's looking at my mouth all the time. And I say, well, that's great because they're trying to figure out how you're moving your mouth. And I do have non-speaking teenagers who have reported to us that they don't know how to move their mouth in, in terms of making words. And a, a lot of this is dependent on what happens with the visual processing centers. So in the TED Talk, and I do encourage you take a look, and it's about 20 minutes. I mean, I don't love robotics, so sorry to this guy up here, but it, I found that part a little bit boring personally. But at the end, he says something that completely transformed my understanding of autism. He said that if people can't process moving information, the whole brain slows down. So that's why this has to be a critical intervention. You imagine not being able to process the world like it's just blurry or fuzzy or foggy or overwhelming. Um, I have a really good friend uh, who is a, a developmental optometrist. And again, when I started to learn a little bit more about the vision being a medical concern in autism, uh, we had her out to a conference um, that we put on years ago. And in the course of sort of figuring out what, what she would talk about, she said to me, Sonia, I want you to put on these glasses. Um, because this will help you understand what children with autism are dealing with as they're trying to process the world visually. I said, yeah, I would like, I would really like to know. And she said, I need to warn you though, because you could be nauseous or you might have a headache. I mean, you might even throw up. They really, they really disrupt your ability to process the world. And I said, okay, well, thank you for the warning, but I, I need to understand what these kids are dealing with. So I put them on and I, I probably had them on for less than two minutes. I, I was so uncomfortable. I was so disoriented and, and it changed the way that I was looking at kids with autism when they came into my office. You know, um, I have had kids where they come in and they, they shake things in front of their eyes. You know, I have a big wall that's all a whiteboard wall for the kids to draw on, but also for me to, <laughs> to show, you know, things that I enjoy to explain visually, but the, you know, so I have all these whiteboard markers, different colors. I, and I have one little girl, she came in and she was doing this in front of her eyes and parents say, you know, she shows very little eye contact. She stims all the time. And so I had explained this to them. So they start treatment. They come back a month later, she grabs some markers. She does the same thing, but she does it further away from her eyes. And so the parents said, yeah, she's got a little more eye contact. You know, she's she's a little bit more aware, but she's still stimming a lot in front of her eyes. They said, but yeah, it's not right in front of her eyes. So this is progression. So then I you know, saw her probably two months after that. And she came in and she, she tried to write on the wall. Um, so that brain was starting to heal. So language and writing, because writing is a fine motor skill, as you know, visual processing is a fine motor skill. And so is talking. And all of these are dependent on properly treating the, the visual symptoms. So what, this is again, like I kind of like having it up here so I can go into the treatment piece. Um, I'm gonna have to search this here. So cod liver oil. I've been putting this stuff up forever. And, and so sometimes what I'm looking for is in a different blog post or whatever. But so cod liver oil. Cod liver oil is 
an omega-3 fatty acid. It is an essential fatty acid. And your child's brain is all fat. Um, our bodies run on good fat. So not unhealthy fat that we would sort of look at as being more like that yellow fat, maybe what people would, you know, sort of gather around the abdomen. That fat is not healthy. But white fat, so if you imagine if you're cooking like a turkey or a chicken breast and you pull up the skin, the, that white fat, that is what our body runs on. And so cod liver oil provides fuel for the body directly um, and the brain needs a ton of fuel. There's also, keep in mind, and I don't know if I chatted about this last time with you, but brain inflammation is a hallmark of autism, right? So if you look at, um, you know, brain inflammation, autism, here we go. You're going to see this research has really shown, and not to be gruesome, but when they've looked at brain tissue for people who have passed away who were diagnosed with autism, they have chronic lifelong inflammation in their brain. Well, the cod liver oil is not only an essential fat that helps to provide energy for the brain and the eyes, it's anti-inflammatory. Like you can treat inflammatory bowel disease, you can treat asthma, you can treat eczema, all of those are inflammatory. If you have inflammation, you have fat deficiency. And so we dose this really high, like I'll dose this at um, 30 to 60 mils, which is two to four tablespoons. And that is, you know, six to 10 times higher than the adult dose. It is very safe, but it, if you have inflammation in the brain, you can't, you can't take small doses. Um, so that's one on, on dosing. Two on dosing is the vitamin A. So the vitamin A um, actually has to be dosed high enough to work. And, and one of the biggest questions we get from parents is, well, is it too much vitamin A? I got that question today. There's, there's a very specific dose for vitamin A that you cannot exceed. Um, it's 4,000 units per kilogram. So it's just, you know, we do the math, say to a parent, you know, your child's 10 kilos, so don't take more than 40,000. And there is zero safety issue. So when we dose it with the right amount and the right form, the vitamin A inside the cod liver oil is the right form. So you can get the right form outside of cod liver oil, but it's more difficult to find. So the cod liver oil really does work the best. Um, the form is called cis. It's the cis form of vitamin A. Um, and what you'll get sometimes is the trans form or you'll get the synthetic form. So this is the natural form of vitamin A that comes in cod liver oil. And here, this little section goes into the vitamin A reconnecting the retinoid receptors. So this is really, I mean, I still find it fascinating, especially when you have parents come in and they have no idea these visual symptoms are medical. And if they're medical, they're treatable. And in, in a, most people, these visual issues are reversible. Um, I've had some tricky cases over the years with the vision. It's taken me a couple of years to actually get it treated, but most of the time it's treated uh, much faster than that. So I can put this in, I don't know if you guys want this, but I'll put it in the chat. And let's see here. I'm just going to check in the chat. Um, yeah, so the head banging can be visual. It can also be fecal loading. And I'm going to do a whole thing on fecal loading, I think maybe next week, but fecal loading means stool accumulation within the bowel. How that relates to vitamin A could be like this. Vitamin A helps us visually process the world. It helps our brains learn to see. Vitamin A is also responsible for governing gut health. And, and you don't hear that, right? I, I don't know if it's new to you guys, but I actually have naturopathic colleagues who, who aren't really um, up to date on that information. Vitamin A polices and governs the health of your child's ecosystem in their gut. So when we think about like things like the, you know, the gut microbiome, or we think about autism and the gut health, this is directly related to your vitamin A levels. And so vitamin A deficiency has been linked to autism. And what is fascinating is that the lower the vitamin A, the more severe the autism. And there may be other groups, but this is the group I'm most familiar with. And 
these researchers have looked at, you know, vitamin A deficiency being linked to severity of autism. And then, okay, let's treat it. Let's see what we can do about improving symptoms of autism. And, and they're seeing it here. So this study is, well, I don't know how long. It looks like 2018. But some of this information, the hypothesis or the, the theory was put forth 20 years ago. Um, and so you can imagine how many children have never actually had treatment for their visual processing. And like I said, it's all very treatable. So that's one of the core four biomedical treatments. Um, do you guys have any questions about that at all? I don't know. If, I don't know if you guys are, if you're a quiet group or I'm, I'm, I'm used to more questions, but I, I want to make sure I'm answering things that you're interested in. And I'll just keep kind of plugging away unless, unless you, you tell me otherwise. So one of the other ways that the cod liver oil is really, really important as a core treatment for autism, I like to call it core four, just because it helps parents, I think, give us um, a step-by-step -step process. Like not everything is going to be treated by these four things, but a lot of things are. Um, increased awareness, increased communication, increased articulation clarity, um, increased understanding, increased following of directions. So why is that? Like, why, how could these four interventions, so methyl B12, paleo diet, which I can take questions on, now cod liver oil, I'm adding in the third one. So how could these possibly, these three things, result in so many improvements? Well, it, it comes down to the mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are the energy project production factories in our cells. Your mitochondria make all of your energy. So you can't do anything without your mitochondria. You can't talk, you can't move your eyes, you can't walk, you can't jump, you can't do anything. Your gut can't move, your heart doesn't beat. So our body runs on what is called ATP, which is just your energy molecule. I like to think of it like um, currency, right? Unfortunately, we can't do much without currency. Um, pretty much everything in our system runs on currency. So in autism, the research has shown and, and this is what, you know, I say is incontrovertible. There's sometimes there's theories, sometimes there's philosophies, but the, the research in autism with respect to the mitochondria is very clear. It's impaired. People with autism have impaired mitochondrial function. So if you don't have enough ATP, we actually have predictable downstream weaknesses. And what I mean by that is that this is a visual representation of where the energy in the body is allocated. So if you look at this little guy, if he, he's called a homunculus. And the homunculus tells us where does the energy go? So you can see that the lips and the tongue need a ton of energy to function. The eyes need a ton of energy to function. And so do the hands. So if you have this much energy, the majority of it is going to those places. So if a child has mitochondrial impairment, you have predictable weaknesses in these areas, the fine motor skills. And keep in mind that these eyes and mouth and hands are all fine motor skills. Sometimes we sort of just think about the writing and the holding of pencils. Um, other research has actually shown that the cell membrane, so the, the membrane that surrounds our cells, if it's damaged, it induces autism symptoms. And there's a drug that you can actually use to treat it. And in an animal model of autism, all the autism symptoms went away. This is called sura, suramin. I don't know if I say it properly. Um, but the mitochondria play a huge role in why children have autism. All regression is mitochondrial. If your child regressed, and I am always sorry to hear, um, regression is a particular grief uh, in terms of a child completely changing their trajectory of development, Regression is medical, or regression, yes, is medical. It has to do with something damaging the mitochondria or something damaging the cell membrane. Now keep in mind the cell membrane surrounds the cell and inside the cell are these little mitochondria trying to pump out energy. Um, so all speech delay is mitochondrial. All fine motor delay is mitochondrial. So if you can get in enough fuel for the mitochondria, you're gonna see all those improvements that I discussed earlier because you're making more energy. And that's why cod liver oil at the dose that we use is transformative for autism. 
it's not a little dose when you think about um, 30 uh, mils is two full cooking tablespoons. Um, the other time we sort of see this requirement for fat is cystic fibrosis. In, in that case, the kids with cystic fibrosis can't absorb fat very well. And so often they're put on a diet that's 50% fat. Well, our kids actually end up with a problem in the gut because of slow energy production. And keep in mind how long your intestines are. Your, your intestines are up to 15 feet long. So if you lack energy, you are going to have a slow gut. This is the picture of the large intestine. If you have slow energy production, you're going to accumulate stool in different parts of your intestine, particularly where they fight gravity. So when you look at this part here from you know, 13 to nine, this is on the right side of your body. This is called the ascending colon. It has to push poop from here, down here, up. So that pipe, that, that part of the children's digestive tract is often full because they don't have the energy to get rid of all the stool. And your child can poop every day. They can have beautiful, perfect bowel movements and they can still have old stool and usually do have old stool stuck in the intestine. And when they have old stool in the intestine, and I just kind of drew this picture as you can probably tell, but you then actually can't absorb properly. So I had a little boy today and lovely family. And this child is getting so much fish oil and he still has the visual symptoms. He's still not absorbing. And what's happening is the old stool has now created an old crusty layer that's blocking absorption. This is the reason why our kids have persistent fat-based symptoms. Eye contact is a fat-based symptom. Stimming is a fat-based symptom. Um, language delay. These are all related to the body not getting enough fat, first through absorption, and second to provide it to the mitochondria to produce energy. So I do have a couple questions, so I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Let's see here. Okay, chronic constipation, fiber gummies. Okay, so these kids are so constipated, um, it is staggering. So first I'm gonna to touch on the um, level of constipation and the stickiness. This is exactly what I'm talking about. We're gonna talk about this right now, thank you. Um, and then B12 for energy, totally. I'll touch, I'll do that one really quick because it's a great question and, and it's a little bit shorter in answer. So we talked about last time how B12 helps to support 200 downstream pathways. And one of those pathways is actually um, to make glutathione and glutathione protects the mitochondria. So right there, once you protect the mitochondria, they can make more energy. The other mechanism is that B12 makes something called carnitine and carnitine is in these cell membranes and it actually transports fat into the cell. So just imagine, you know, if the fat is like uh, people waiting for a fairy, the fairy itself is carnitine. So fat cannot get inside the cell to help the mitochondria without carnitine. Carnitine is one of the most researched supplements in autism. It's extremely safe. It's extremely effective. Um, it's used for all kinds of stuff, though. It's used for, we were just talking about myocarditis, myocarditis long COVID. Uh, it's used for Alzheimer's. It's really fascinating. But really what it's doing is providing more fat inside the cell, right? So you're you're increasing the amount of fat that your cell has because we run on fat. We run on healthy, clean, good fat. And inflammation means you don't have enough fat, any type of inflammation. So that's the glutathione piece. There's a few other little things in there, but I, I think you guys are, I really, this is such an important, these kids are so constipated, it's staggering. So I run bowel x-rays. Well, actually I asked doctors to run the bowel x-rays and a lot of them, can do support that. So they come back with something called fecal loading. And fecal loading is old stool. If you take an x-ray and you find stool, that's old stool. If you see stool on, um, you, you can't see old stool on an ultrasound. So there's so much stool stuck in the intestines of these children that once we start flushing it out, I'll tell you, we've seen mucus, we've seen hard rocks, we've seen slimy, gooey, 
you know, disgusting, foul smelling. Last week I had a parent describe it as a rotting dead horse, right? Garbage, just acidic, funky, the, unbelievable. And this smells like that because it's been in there for years. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating. Um, I had a family doing enemas once and they actually said that something came out that was so hard. It was like bark. They, they couldn't dissolve it. Um, my own son with autism, who's 11 now, when we had a lot of stuff come out of his bowel, one time it came out and it was like black goo. It, we called it the venom poo. You know how Spider-Man has that, you know, all, whatever alter ego venom. It was like that. And we could barely flush it. I've had parents report stools so large, they can't flush it. Um, the stickiness comes from microbes. So keep in mind that vitamin A plays that incredibly important role in keeping the gut flora under control. So in autism, we actually have problems with the ecosystem in the gut. And, you know, I think I might've touched on this in terms of the, the researcher because he is Canadian. So Derek McFabe is a Canadian researcher who discovered that microbes like Clostridia um, are related to autism. Because the vitamin A is low, they have eye contact issues, spinning, side glancing, lining up, grouping, you know, all this stuff we talked about. And then because the vitamin A is low, they also then have problems within the digestive tract. And so when you look at the digestive issues, they relate directly back in large part to the vitamin A. So the ecosystem in the gut in autism we know is different. So the ecosystem of the gut is often called the microbiome. The microbiome is made up of 400 trillion microbes. And in autism, they have discovered that the microbiome, the ecosystem in the gut is altered. It's altered in part because the vitamin A can't keep the opportunistic microbes under control. And what I mean by opportunistic is that they're troublemakers, right? It could be normal stuff that lives in the human bowel, but without enough vitamin A, it starts to grow over in much higher numbers. So one of those examples is Clostridia. You probably are most familiar with Clostridia with hospital kind of diarrhea, C. diff. Well, C. diff is one member of the Clostridia family. And when they first started doing research into Clostridia in the stool of children diagnosed with autism, they, have, they'd have that, they would have up to nine different members of the Clostridia family in the stool, which is very abnormal. The neurotypical kids or the normal kids when they looked at their stool, they had like one, maybe one member of this Clostridia family. So then the Canadian researcher said, well, what if we, we take Clostridia and we put it into an animal model and he actually caused brain inflammation from the Clostridia? Well, you can reduce Clostridia by starving it. That goes back to the diet. In fact, Dr. McFabe did get rid of Clostridia. Um, he did get rid of the brain inflammation in that autism model. Uh, let's see if it's in here. This research was so incredible that th this researcher and physician, he won a top 50 scientific findings in Canadian history. So he was able to induce the brain inflammation, which remember is a hallmark of autism. And then he was able to reverse it by taking out the complex carbohydrates. So this research is so incredible he actually spoke at the Nobel laureate conference in 2015 because he was able to reverse the inflammation by taking out the complex carbohydrates. So this is pretty interesting um, and relates back to why the gut is so sticky. Microbes make mucus, right? If you've ever had like a sinus infection, then you'll know that, that mucus is produced when there are abnormal microbes in this sort of cavity. I wanted to show you this other one here. I'm going to see if I can find it. Yeast symptoms. Parents often read this and they're like, oh my goodness, this, this sounds like my kid. So I'll put that up when I'm chat while I'm chatting about microbes. So microbes make the stool sticky and then the stool sticks to the gut wall. And then the stool comes along and more stool sticks there, more stool sticks there and then the children become more and more constipated. It leads to the fecal loading. And um, there's another really incredible paper that I wanna show you, but um, I'm gonna leave this up for a second just so you can take a look. 
these are often medical, almost always medical. Aggression, self-injury, headbanging, um, chewing on everything, laughing for no reason. The microbes in the gut make really weird metabolites. Yeast, for example, makes aldehydes, which are indistinguishable from alcohol. Um, you know, kids grind their teeth at night, they walk on their toes, they're addicted to carbohydrates, they can't get enough of the carbs. This is often because there's overgrowth of things living in the gut. And so starving those microbes works really well. Um, yeast feeds on grains, so does Clostridia. And then making sure you have enough vitamin A to allow the ecosystem in the gut to get back under control. So let's see here. You can clear the bowels in a number of different ways. Um, and it's really safe to do so. If you can get a bowel x-ray, I'm gonna give you this paper to check out. This paper is, is really, really, um, it's a landmark paper, it's just mind blowing. This is a pediatric gastroenterologist and him and his group put together this research paper that was published in pediatrics. And basically what they were able to show is these symptoms are related to an undiagnosed problem in the gut. This paper is so accurate that I recommend parents print out the paper, highlight the symptoms that your child is experiencing. Now, oh, that's, that's a good one too. I'm gonna to come back to that, but this is the one I'm looking for. If your child is experiencing any or all of these, you can diagnose fecal loading on a bowel x-ray. You can clean out the gut and these behaviors will get better. <coughs> I've had kids literally banging their head through walls, breaking down the door, scratching, biting, kicking, screaming, um, not sleeping at all, waking up in the middle of the night, crying. All, I've had all of these. I've had teeth grinding to the point of damage to the teeth. These are caused by an undiagnosed problem in the gut. So what this doctor is saying, and he's a pediatric gastroenterologist. He is at Boston Children's. He is a very big deal in the autism world. He is saying these behaviors may be markers of abdominal pain or discomfort in, in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. And the stool is stuck to the gut wall. Those bugs are making metabolites and it's making our kids' brains really nuts. Sometimes the kids have tics. Sometimes they do things like tapping constantly. This list is gold. So you print it out, you highlight these symptoms, you go to the doctor and you say, I would like my child to get a bowel x-ray because that's what this is saying. If your child has these symptoms, get a bowel x-ray. That's one of the ways we can look at the bowel and, and we can start to get the gut cleared out. Now, sometimes the doctors say no. And uh, then we still try to move forward because it's so important to get rid of that old stuff. Keeping in mind that the mitochondria are not making enough energy. The gut is slow. The vitamin A deficiency leads to the visual symptoms and then the gut flora. The, the opportunistic bad bugs, if you will, start to grow over, causing more and more and more problems. And it, and it is then a vicious cycle. So I think that answers the sticky question. I answered the B12 question. Um, so old stool, yeah, old stool looks crazy. Um, fiber isn't enough. It literally sticks to the gut wall. Like it attaches to the gut wall. I had one boy dually diagnosed ADHD autism, really sweet kid, really smart. Um, and then all of a sudden he just started losing it. Like, I think he was like throwing chairs, punching, hitting, kicking. Parents took him to the hospital and they were about to put him on antipsychotics. So they called me from the hospital and I said, get a, get, get a bowel x-ray. And they didn't get it at first, went home. Um, I had said to them, just do the treatment for the bowel. Like if, if it's that or going on antipsychotics, you're you're inducing diarrhea or you're you're getting out old stool or you're putting a kid on risperidone so they did it and then I had a call with them kids getting better he's, he's not all the way better so I said well keep doing the treatment and he, he kept getting better and better six months of using laxatives on and off he gets a colonoscopy and the doctor has to suck the stool off the gut wall 
I have another patient who where they couldn't get the endoscopy, like the you know colon. How do you guys know what a colonoscopy colonoscopy is, right? They usually get it at fifty age, after the age of fifty. You clear out the bowel with a big big laxative. You put a camera in to look around for things like tumors or polyps or diverticulitis stuff like that. So usually kids don't get that. But when kids are scoped with autism, they find inflammation in the bowel. They find problems in the bowel, in the bowel. Um, and so another child that I work with, they tried to do a camera through the mouth into the small intestine. It was so sticky in there. They couldn't even get through. Your kids are filled with sticky old poop and the sticky old poop is causing massive behaviors that are extremely treatable. Um, I could literally, I could sit, if I could stay awake, I could sit here for days telling you stories about this paper and how this paper over and over and over again, we are able to see these symptoms clear. And, and the big thing that this group of doctors is saying is that these have to be ruled out as medical before they're treated as behaviors. And just to sort of show you who we're talking about here, these, is this the list of doctors? I'm trying to see where their names are. This is an uncooperative paper today. So this is called Evaluation, Diagnosis and Treatment of Gastrointestinal Disorders in Individuals with ASDs, a consensus report. So you look at Tim Bowie. This is the guy at Boston Children's, right? You look at the list of where these children are, or sorry, where these researchers are. So they have come together with a consensus port, report uh, to say, if a child comes into your office, you have to evaluate the bowel if they present with these behaviors. Uh, let's see here. Do, do. I think one of the questions was gluten-free, casein-free, mild autism. I'm a swing for the fences, Doc. Um, I have a kid with autism who didn't talk until he was almost four and a half. Uh, he's in grade six. He doesn't get help. He plays sports. He has friends. He's at age level. I, I, I believe in big treatments because I want big, big, big results. If you asked me that question and I was your doctor, I'd say, why not? Why not do the harder treatment to get bigger results? Um, can you get benefit? Maybe. And, and there are lots of naturopaths who recommend easier things. But I'll tell you, nothing is easier than having a kid who can do more things as they're older. And nothing is harder than having a child who continues to struggle when you could medically treat it. Um, let's see, Tylenol. Yeah, if you have to give Tylenol, if you can find it, um, <laughs> um, you can give N-acetylcysteine. So N-acetylcysteine is part of what makes glutathione. So glutathione is made of N-acetylcysteine it is made of glycine and it is made of glutamate. So remember that glutamate is also contributing to a lot of the problems in the autistic brain and that glutamate is high when there's problems with methylation. And so N-acetylcysteine was studied at Stanford and it is extremely safe and it can be given to, given, given to kids if they have to have Tylenol to prevent the deficiency because the danger of Tylenol is it, it depletes glutathione, right? So then it, to replenish the glutathione, you give the N-acetylcysteine. And one of the questions we get is, well, why, don't, why wouldn't you just give glutathione? Glutathione is made of glutamate. So when you give glutathione, you are giving more glutamate. And there are circumstances where that may be important, like if a child has mold toxicity. But typically what we want to be doing is we want to be giving N-acetylcysteine, which is the rate limiting step. So basically to make your glutathione, you need enough N-acetylcysteine. And interestingly enough, to circle back to the gluten-free, dairy-free, one of the reasons that works is that gluten and dairy stop you from making glutathione. They're also inflammatory and they also feed the bad bugs in the gut. But this is one of the big goals of autism therapy. And that's the connection of the B12, right? B12 helps to make glutathione. Then the B12 can make more glutathione if your child's on the diet. Um, and then if you, you put them on the diet, they can also make more glutathione because the, the gluten and the casein has been removed. Ideally, it is the grains. Um, I go back to that Derek McFave research. I mean, like this doctor gave animals brain inflammation and they looked exactly like these brains, actually. So these brains that were studied on at Johns Hopkins, 
those brains showed lifelong inflammation in the brain. And then our researcher here in Canada induced that. And he reversed it by taking out the complex carbohydrates. Those brains that they looked at were so deficient in fats. Uh, a later researcher started looking at the B12 levels in the brain, which I think I showed you this last time. Mm. I've done a few talks since you guys. So I, I, I'm like, what, what, what do we talk about? Um, I did a two hour webinar thing for NatchPass and I did, a, and I'm, not, I'm not an advisor for a board, so I did stuff for them. But um, right. So when we think about like, well, is B12 aggressive because it's a needle? If your child has very little B12 in their brain, it's like an old person's brain. That's what this paper is saying. I think they said that, um, for example, children with autism under the age of 10 have three times lower brain B12 levels. So when you're thinking about these treatments, please think about what it would be like to be having an inflamed brain and then ask yourself, like, is it worth it? Is the bread worth it? Is the cereal worth it? Right. Is, is you don't want to give injections. They're hundred percent safe, right? Is the, is replenishing brain B12 worth it? And, and I can be a pain in the butt. You can ask Robin. I mean, lots of my families would tell me, actually, I have a family who they used to tell me they used to, the mom used to cry on the way home from my visits because I will hold the line. I will, I will share with you the best treatment that I think, you know, is out there for your child. And if that not, if it's not easy, that doesn't, and it's not going to change my opinion. Muesli is not bad, but the problem with muesli is it, it's great. It's not your fault your child can't deal with grains. Um, we talked about the propionic acid piece that depletes B12 last time. Grains slow methylation. Grains feed the bad bugs. Grains cause inflammation every time you feed them to your kids. It, it's not your fault. It's not your kid's fault. But it's like having a diabetic kid and be like, well, I don't feel like giving them their insulin and they can eat whatever they want. It's not a luxury that we have. And I feel bad because a lot of things if not every single thing in autism is hard, but as Robin's experienced and as I've, I've experienced and literally thousands of the families that we work with, your child will be better if you put them on these, you know, sort of core few interventions. And I'm not trying to pretend that they're easy, but I do feel very strongly that medical treatment is a human right. And if you don't know your child has medical issues, you can't treat them, but that's why we're hopefully reaching more and more people with Robin's help. Um, these visual symptoms I spoke about in the beginning, very treatable, very reversible. You can improve mitochondrial function in any person on the planet. And uh, you know, it does take a leap of faith. It takes some massive effort and uh, cooperation within your families. But I encourage you guys to try some of this. And then I'm going to pause. I'm going to check through a few more questions. And then I'm going to make sure... I get through them here. F pies, yeah, F pies is the sticky gooey stuff in the gut. And my, my niece has F pies and we used to not really totally understand it, but it's a very mm -hmm. similar mechanism. The, the microbes More are funny. mucus. It's like a sticky mucus mm -hmm. also stuck to the gut wall. And so that will create food reactions with, with the F pies. Um, blood work is awesome, but blood work's not perfect. Um, in this study with the brain tissue, the reason they did that study is because the B12 levels in the blood weren't telling them anything. Same thing with the vitamin A. It's very difficult to find out what's happening inside the cells. If you give your child B12 and, and they're more aware, they're happier, they talk more, they sleep better, they stim less, um, they, you know they need it, and it's water-soluble, it is non-toxic, you cannot hurt children with B12. And as long as you stay under the weight-based dose of vitamin A, which is 4,000 international units per kilogram, as long as you stay under that, it is 100% safe. It is fat soluble. It's theoretically toxic. You would have to give massive doses, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, you'd have to watch your child yeah. suffer for months and months and months. Mm -hmm. um, high I'm, dose, right, I'm right here, though. <laughs> high dose vitamin. Um, I love you, baby. High dose vitamin A is um, safe. Too much vitamin A will give you very mm -hmm. severe symptoms that you won't be able to ignore. Um, I don't know that there's a full replacement for Tylenol, but there's some really good stuff out there. 
Uh, if you guys email here, I'll put this info at Natural Care Clinic. They can mm -hmm. send you our fever management handout. There's some really good stuff out there that you can do. If your child is lethargic, if your child's fever is out of control, you, you got to use Tylenol to get it down again if you can find it. But you can intervene for lower fevers very safely. Um, and so that's why we've created this fever management hand handout. I'll see if I can find it and send it to Robin too. But our staff can send it to you. So yeah, I think I've got all the questions. Let's see here. Yeah, I think I got, did you guys think I missed any or do you have any additional questions? All right, Robin, I don't know if you're on with us, but oh, I have a new message here. So this is um, one of the reasons I created this website. It was purely for education. I used to go down to the United States to train with researchers from all over the world, and I would come back and I would be so excited to share it with my families. But I, you know, I, I also thought it would be easier if I could post it and have it available here. So the first step in treatment I call core four. So I believe these are the four most bio, four most important biomedical treatments, but not just me. I've trained with, you know, many, many, many autism doctors. I have mentors who help to improve thousands of kids' lives. Um, and, you know, we're, we're headed to Dubai. We're headed throughout Canada. We're, we might be going to India in April. Like we, we will say yes to everything. And it's because we want families like you to know there are medical and treatable aspects of autism and keep spreading the word because I believe very strongly every parent deserves to know this. So step one, methyl B12. We talked about methyl B12 injections last time. They're done with a very small insulin syringe. They're done three times a week into the buttocks. You would do them at home. They're hundred percent safe and they help 90% of the time. A high dose autism fo focused multivitamin. This is mine, doesn't have to be mine. There's about five or six really great ones on the market. Um, they're really gross, but they're really amazing. The cod liver oil we focused on today, very high dose, acts as an anti-inflammatory, provides fat that turns into energy for our body to help with visual processing, integrating visual information, articulation, clarity, and language, motor skills, and even strength like core, muscle strength, uh, muscle tone. And then the vitamin A itself helps to repair the visual processing, reducing the symptoms like stimming in front of the eyes, side glancing, lining up, squinting eyes. There's a ton of them. Anything kids do with their eyes, actually. I, every year I sort of pick up another one I think has to do with the eyes. Oh, some of the kids do this. They lens in and out like they're a camera. Um, and then some people just avoid the eye contact. Or some people just look at people that they know, but not other people. That's still, still visual integration. They've integrated their parents. They have it integrated strangers. Or they can't stand going to new places. That's visual processing. They want things the same, right? My son, when he was little, he used to push my sleeves up. I always wear my, anything I'm wearing, I push the sleeves up. So if they weren't up and he saw it, he'd come push them up. I also always wear my hair up in a bun. And so if my hair was down, he would come and try and put it up. That's visual processing. But you need to things to look the same. Or kids who can't go to the mall. I have one boy, he's now highly, highly recovered. Um, so he's at age level, doesn't need help in school, plays sports, has friends. And he used to be totally fine at home. And they go to the mall and he'd look pretty severely autistic. That was all visual. So that's a lot of what we touched on today. Um, and then the diet. And listen, I get it. It's hard. I'm not pretending it's not. The difference that people see is just incredible. And, and I'll remind you, I think I showed you this last time, but this is a world-renowned pediatric neurologist. She is one of the most highly um, thought of or renowned researchers in autism in the entire world. I'm going to give you one guess what her whole book is about. It's about the grain-free, dairy-free diet. So this is all about improving our kids' lives. It's all about reducing their pain, helping their sensory system, and improving their communication, improving their learning skills, uh, and improving their ability to socialize and, you know, hang out with us, hang out with their siblings, make friends. 
I don't know. RMT is what? Food testing. I don't like food testing because I think food testing is one of the ways that we try to convince ourselves that the diet isn't necessary. When we look at the biochemistry, however, whatever our belief system is, if you believe in a higher power, then we were given meat, vegetables, fruit, nuts, seeds, and eggs to eat. If you believe in evolution, you know, we for 15 million years, we ate meat, vegetable, fruit, nuts, seeds, and eggs. This is our human diet. The original human diet is the paleo diet, if you will. Um, I don't know about the doctors and psychiatrists. We don't see a ton of autism treatment in Canada. There's there's a handful of us that do this. Um, outside of that, it's tough. I mean, I did work with a psychiatrist for a couple of years before the pandemic. He would just send everyone to me for the B12. I think they might be able to theoretically, but they also have a pretty controlled scope of practice. And they believe that autism is purely a mental health issue. So they don't believe there's medical aspects to autism. And so they don't treat them. That's why I really encourage you to take this, this paper and I'll send it to Robin. Um, show it to your doctor. If your child has these symptoms, advocate for a bowel x-ray. Basically, this is a world-renowned gastroenterologist, so gut doctor, saying these behaviors in autism are medical and they're very treatable. It's just that this old stuff is completely stuck in the gut because of the reasons that we reviewed. So I've sent that to Robin. Hopefully she can send it along to you guys because I don't think that's one I can put in the chat. I'll just try, but I think I've tried it before. It's a PDF and I'm really not that savvy as I think Robin knows. <laughs> um, okay, well, any other thoughts, any other questions at all? All right. Well, I'm going to say good night for now and we'll uh, touch base next week. Um, if you guys have particular areas that you want me to touch on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it, then I can touch on those. You can send their, your questions to Robin. Um, you can send them to info at Natural Care Clinic and we can review or we can move on to some other thoughts. Um, but the gut, the gut flushing might be a good one too. Um, you can get a lot of a lot of benefit from that. So I'll Um, yeah, physicians, uh, the best I have right now is doctors who refer. They seem to have over my 18 years, um, had enough exposure that they think I'm, I'm worth a shot for families, but there, there are very few people doing this in Canada. Um, it's, it's mostly naturopaths. There's a handful of physicians. Um, I think one retired not too long ago and one's gone back to work in the hospital setting. So it's, Again, education, right? We we need to get this out. I try to write letters to all the doctors all the time, particularly when it's about the bowel, so I can get doctors clued into the fact that behavior is not just, you know, not just coming from nowhere. So, all right. Have a good night. Thank you, folks. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you.